we get together, other readings, open mics, there's a reward there. And it may be a small reward, but it doesn't matter. The size isn't important. It's just being with other poets. Or an audience of just people who aren't poets, poets but they like poetry. So, it, you know, it's, it's a good thing, like most of us, I don't have to make a living at it, but, <laughs> but yeah. It's, Still it's, worthwhile. Yeah, it's really the key to my, my years now. And I get excited when I write something. I, I really do. I feel good about it. Regardless of the quality, I feel good about what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, well, I was diagnosed with leukemia three years ago, whatever. And then I wrote a whole series of poems, just four poems, but impressionistic responses to what it was all about, you know. And they were wonderful. Yeah. You may have heard them as parts of it one time, and, and I thought the, the reaction was appropriate. Because when, when you, you're diagnosed with something that is perhaps fatal, you don't want to, you know, I don't want to write a dirge. You know, that, that's, I write enough poems about dying. But it, it just, it's it just, you know, three, four lines at a time, brief lines. And I ended up, I guess, with about 15 pages of poetry. Um, four sections, and, and so you, you, you use what's available. Yeah. And that's a hard time not to get sentimental, but you managed to do it. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know what would cause me to feel self-pity or something like that. I can write about it, and I know the times that, that, that There'll be phrases or whatever that, that are weak. Okay. And maybe I'll change them, maybe I won't. Maybe I just will just put them aside and you know come back to them, you know, next year, whatever. Because there's always notebooks full of half completed work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. We're winding down, and what we'd like to do is just have Raj read a couple poems that, that he wants to share. And uh, thank you for this interview, Roger. That's better. And, it's uh, not Raj, it's Roger. Just okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for the interview. You, you wouldn't call him my. Glad we established that. <laughs> um, okay. So, this is a poem about my father who was an extremely frustrated individual. Um, in another poem I wrote, he was a great father and a lousy husband. But, and this is a poem where I also frequently will use the title as part of the first line of the poem, as an intro. So the first two words on this, in this poem was Sisyphus. And then it, that just goes right into the body of the poem. Was Sisyphus his good fairy, my father, an energetic entrepreneur before the word became a cliché? After World War II, he opened a trade school for GIs, was part of a small group that manufactured TV tubes. The comforts of success always denied, as he found new ways to poison relationships. He jumped at every opportunity, worked hard, Still, his dream of an ill-defined respectability remained unreachable. But, two shots of B&B, &B, and he was a pixelated six-year-old, enjoying giggling innocence. A pivotal event I can only guess at. In his Eagle Scout uniform, riding shotgun as a decoy for his bootlegger father on delivery day. Achievement devalued. Self-esteem washed away in the pathology of bathtub gin. Now, here's, this was just written, I guess, a couple years ago. It's 
from a group of poems I wrote about Paris. And it's called Les Mondi Mondiales, Beggars. Before Notre Dame, oh, so I put some French in here, not to show off, but just to show <laughs> off. Um, because I just thought, of, you know, simple stuff that would just change the poem a little bit. Before Notre Dame, two women pleading for alms, and I think, go inside, prie en saint du pop, who could readily ease your plight. An old man huddled on a stool, a small dog curled in his lap, always gets a euro. The dog must eat. <laughs> a woman bent so low at the waist she cannot see who is dropping a coin in her cup. Une autre femme sits on a doorstep, avec deux valises by her side, sticks out a stiff-armed cup, empty of hope and promise. There are many who sit with backs braced against the buildings, staring blankly past their empty cups, often a small child by their side. More untold stories of failure. Finally, another femme désespérée, a phone to her ear, a dog on a leash, and in the leash hand a cup, frantically waved at those who pass in measured indifference. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.